at the terrifying new alien encounter where they're going to be transporting a live alien creature right into the same room with us. Try to contain your enthusiasm. Are you guys scared? No. There's no reason. It's the future. It's science. Let's go. Come on. We've all had our shots. I'll guard the exit. I'm right behind you. In 1993, Disneyland's Tomorrowland was growing increasingly outdated. The current iteration of the area of the park opened in 1967, and as a result, represented a 60s view of the future that was irrelevant to modern guests. In an effort to renew dwindling interest in Disneyland, a major refurbishment to modernize the area was planned, entitled Tomorrowland 2055. The refurbishment would have the land lose its city of tomorrow look and take on an alien spaceport theme and see several of the existing attractions replaced with more thematically appropriate ones. However, shortly after its conception, the plan was scrapped as a result of the poor financial performance of the recently opened Euro Disneyland, now Disneyland Paris. The following year, a reworked version of the refurbishment without the 2055 name was instead brought to Walt Disney World in Florida. The new Tomorrowland of Florida depicted the tomorrow that never was, a futuristic alien spaceport where life forms from across the galaxy come to interact with each other. Several attractions were also introduced to the new Tomorrowland to fit its theme, including the Timekeeper Circle Vision film, and a mysterious high-intensity attraction replacing Mission to Mars, which made heavy use of binaural audio and special effects in complete darkness, and may just have been the most controversial attraction Disney has ever made. While Extraterrestrial Alien Encounter opened in 1994, the story of the ill-fated attraction begins 10 years earlier, with the instatement of perhaps the most talked about man in Disney fandom, Michael Eisner. Among the many tasks required of him to save what was, at the time, a failing company, Eisner began searching for ways to boost attendance numbers at Disney's theme parks. But when he asked his teenage son to join him on a tour of Disneyland, his son told him he didn't want to go because that place is for babies. Eisner realized that Disney had failed to capitalize on the emerging teenage and young adult market in the theme park industry that was currently being enjoyed by the likes of Six Flags, and so hurriedly directed Disney's Imagineers to pitch several new attractions that could appeal to an older, more thrill-oriented audience. One potential ride idea pitched by the Imagineers was based on the hugely popular Alien franchise. The ride would be named Nostromo, after the spaceship from the first film, and would be an interactive dark ride where guests would travel through the corridors of the ship, armed with laser cannons, attempting to rescue stranded crew members and fight off alien threats. Before the plans could be put into action though, senior Imagineers protested that the ride was far too intense for a family theme park, particularly because the source material it was based on was R-rated, so the project was scrapped. However, this idea did prompt Disney to license the Alien IP a few years later to include as a scene in The Great Movie Ride, which opened at MGM Studios in 1989. The basic concept of the ride did also eventually come to fruition over a decade later, but with a much more family-friendly theme as Buzz Lightyear's Space Ranger spin. But that wasn't the end of Nostromo. With the Tomorrowland refurbishment beginning in the 90s, the evil alien concept was brought up once again, this time with a few adjustments. Disney was looking to replace the Disney World version of its now very dated Mission to Mars theater attraction. The attraction originally started life at Disneyland in 1955 as Rocket to the Moon, and was eventually changed to Mars once the Apollo missions had already taken humans to the moon. The show was a theater in the round experience, where a combination of special effects and a projection on both the floor and the ceiling simulated a trip to Mars. A group of Disney Imagineers keen to keep the alien project alive realized they could take the concepts they had developed for Nostromo and rework them into the Mission to Mars theater, incorporating modern special effects and audio animatronic technology. The new idea pitched to Eisner went through several changes, at one point even bringing on board George Lucas to write the story, with the final pitch ultimately being a dark and intense show about a sinister corporation accidentally teleporting a carnivorous alien into a room with guests that then escapes wreaking havoc. Eisner loved the idea of reworking the attraction, as it would cost a lot less than gutting a show building and building something entirely new. And so the new project, entitled Extra Terrestrial Alien Encounter, was underway.
You know, I gotta believe Jonah has something to do with all this. Hey, where are we anyway? You know, this must be Alien Encounter. Nah, this is Disney. There couldn't be a real alien inside. I'm told they're doing some testing in teletransportation through space. Maybe I'll get sent to Mars. You want to know something? They'd love me on Mars. I'd be a big hit on Mars. Yeah. Come on, I'll take you on a sneak preview. The attraction's story begins in the pre-show, where guests attend the Tomorrowland Interplanetary Convention Center to witness a demonstration of new teleportation technology from alien corporation XS Tech. XS Tech introduces itself to guests as an alien megacorporation, responsible for bringing numerous technologies to less advanced civilizations. The company's chairman, Elsie Clench, welcomes guests and explains the company's philosophy. If something can't be done with XS, then it shouldn't be done at all, while also giving a sinister undertone that excess tech is simply taking advantage of Earth for the purpose of profit. Guests are then ushered into a second pre-show room, where they meet the animatronic XS robot named Sir, or Simulated Intelligence Robotics, voiced by Tim Curry. Sir's tone is even more sinister than the company's chairman, as he proudly demonstrates XS's new teleportation technology to guests through a demonstration involving a clearly captive alien named Skippy. Sir assures guests that the teleportation is practically painless, as Skippy's teleportation chamber fills with smoke, and he appears on the other side of the room visibly burnt. Showing blatant disregard for Skippy, he then explains that one of the guests will surely be participating in a more significant teleportation demonstration, this time not just across the room, but across an entire galaxy. After this, guests are then sent into the former Mission to Mars theater, where the main show begins. Guests are seated around a much larger teleportation chamber and harnessed into their seats with over-the-shoulder restraints. What's interesting to note is that the main purpose of the restraints in Alien Encounter are not for the typical safety reasons harnesses are usually used on rides, as Alien Encounter doesn't move but instead to ensure that guests' heads are correctly positioned for the audio effects from the speakers mounted in the seats to work properly. Alien Encounter made heavy use of binaural audio, a type of 3D stereo sound that aims to give listeners the sensation of being in the room where the sound is coming from. Using this, you can create the illusion that a sound is coming from the side of you or behind you, which Alien Encounter relied on significantly to make its key effects work. On screens around the side of the theater, a live transmission is played from two XS Tech employees. Dr. Femus, the teleportation technician who has reservations about how successful the demonstration will be, and Spinlock, the demonstration's host, attempting to put a positive spin on everything for guests. Initially, the employees select a guest for teleportation to XS Tech headquarters to meet Chairman Clench. But just as the selection is about to be completed, Chairman Clench himself enters the room and decides to change the plan last minute. Instead of bringing just one guest to XS Tech, he decides that instead he will be teleported to the convention center to meet all the guests in person. Eager to get the show moving, Spinlock forces Dr. Femus to send Chairman Clench before the teleportation has been properly calibrated, and so he becomes lost somewhere in the galaxy. While scanning for potential life forms, they come across one that they aren't sure of, but decide it must be the chairman, so send it to Earth anyway. Back in the theater, the chamber flashes with light and fills with smoke, as, horrified, the excess tech employees realize that they haven't teleported Clench, but instead a carnivorous, incredibly dangerous, reptile-like alien. The audience gets its first look at the large, menacing alien animatronic before it breaks free from the teleportation chamber, disappearing from sight and escaping into the room as a power outage plunges the guests into complete darkness. After the initial shock of this moment, a convention center maintenance worker enters the room on the catwalks above the theater in an attempt to restore power, assuring guests that everything's gonna be okay. While the worker's voice and the video feed from his helmet cam playing on the screens are pre-recorded parts of the show, the maintenance worker is also played in person by a cast member who enters the theater above guests to sell the illusion. But while attempting to restore the power, the maintenance worker turns around and sees the alien right in front of him and gets eaten as water jets are sprayed at guests to simulate the blood of the worker. Spinlock and Dr. Femus instruct guests to stay completely silent so as not to attract the alien 
while they wait for the auxiliary power to restore. What follows is an agonizingly long amount of time, where the alien paces around guests as the speakers simulate it patrolling the darkness. And it was this segment of the attraction that demonstrated the main draw of the show. Jets of air would be blasted at guests to simulate the flapping of the wings of the alien as it flew around the room, and its hot breath on the back of their necks. Soft fabric tubes mounted in the seats would have air blasted through them, so they would gently hit the back of guests' heads as if an alien tongue was touching them. Water would be sprayed to simulate alien saliva, and most notably, the binaural audio playing in the seat speakers would create the illusion that the alien was scuttling around the room behind guests' backs as they sit restrained helplessly in their seats. The original audio is now available on YouTube, and while it doesn't quite recreate the same feeling of terror guests would have felt at the time, I really recommend going and listening to it with headphones to try and at least get an understanding of what this would have felt like. In addition to the seat mounted speakers, large subwoofers in the theatre, repurposed from Mission to Mars, are used to simulate the alien flying across the room, and transducers, a sort of speaker without a diaphragm, shake the seats to give a sense of size to the creature. The combination of these special effects, combined with the darkness, gave a very real feeling that a large creature actually was walking around the room as you were strapped in, unable to move. And I guess in a way, this attraction could be likened to Sleep Paralysis the Ride. Finally, the excess tech employees play a loud scream sound to attract the alien, and are able to trap it back inside the teleportation chamber, causing the alien animatronic to reappear inside the tube. They hurriedly try and teleport the alien back to where it came from, as it desperately fights back. In the last attempt, they drop the metal shield surrounding the tube, which collapse on the alien, causing it to explode, spraying the guests with its guts. Spinlock and Dr. Femus reappear on the theatre screens and re-teleport Chem and Clench back into the room with them. Still in the teleportation tube, Clench is furious at them for accidentally sending him to a desolate planet instead, and exclaims that he's going to wring Spinlock's neck when he gets out. Instead of letting this happen, Spinlock and Dr. Femus agree to teleport Chem and Clench back out into space again, getting rid of him. The two apologise for the little glitch that guests may have encountered during the demonstration, but justify it, claiming it does take time to see the future. An alien encounter ends with guests being released from their seats and exiting through the Merchant of Venus gift shop. This show was at Disney World. When Alien Encounter first opened for previews at the end of 1994, it was met with many negative reviews. The primary complaint was obvious. The attraction was far too scary for the Magic Kingdom. The plot of a carnivorous alien killing people while you're trapped in a dark room was at complete odds with a theme park that contained the likes of It's a Small World. It even felt like a complete tonal shift from the other attractions in Tomorrowland, as most things there, such as Carousel of Progress or Space Mountain, were relatively upbeat. The complete darkness in the show helped to amplify the special effects, leaving even adults scared and kids completely traumatised. Michael Eisner ordered the attraction closed a month later for reworking, but instead of toning down the attraction to make it more palatable for the Disney crowd, he instead doubled down on Alien Encounter's intense feel, deciding that it was received negatively not because it was too scary for the Magic Kingdom, but because guests were going in with a misunderstanding of what the attraction was. The original version of the pre-show had the voice of Simpsons character Troy McClure, Phil Hartman playing Sir instead of Tim Curry, in a more jovial and comedic tone, which was theorised to be causing guests to mistake the attraction as something more light-hearted. Welcome to the great big universe of XS. I'm the XS2000 Technobotic Presentation Unit. The Sections of the main show were also reworked and heavily edited to make the introduction of the alien more clear, as the existing pacing of expositionary lines of dialogue were often drowned out at key moments by the screaming of guests. When the new version of the attraction officially opened in June 1995, while some praised the dark tone in comparison to everything else in Tomorrowland, Alien Encounter was still largely met with a negative reception. Despite multiple signs outside warning people that it was inappropriate for younger children, the attraction continued to receive a large volume of complaints from guests about the nature of the show, 
and as a result, not long after opening, Alien Encounters popularity started to dwindle. Wait times were rarely long, and it was regularly a walk on attraction. And so eventually, on October 12th, 2003, after only eight years of operation, extraterrestrial Alien Encounter closed permanently. While it was never officially stated the reason why it closed so soon, low attendance combined with the show's overbearing intensity seems the obvious culprit. Although it should be noted that it has also been theorized the Alien Encounter could have closed instead because of the criminal charges brought against Chairman Clench's actor Jeffrey Jones in 2002 and 2003 and the difficulty in scrubbing him from the attraction, although this has never been confirmed. The show was not fully torn down, however. Not long after closing, the attraction was completely rethemed with a new show, but with many animatronics and the basic special effects remaining, this time to fit the movie Lilo and Stitch which had released two years earlier. In the new show, the story would take place at the Galactic Federation Prisoner Teleportation Center, where guests would be trained as guards and shown a demonstration of prisoner teleportation of Experiment 626, aka Stitch, who would then escape and cause havoc, eventually winding up fourth wall style at Magic Kingdom. Stitch's Great Escape opened on November 16th, 2004. To promote the attraction, Cinderella Castle was also briefly decorated in a now infamous design featuring toilet paper and graffiti to show Stitch taking over Magic Kingdom. As a side note, if you visited Disney World at the time of this castle decoration, please let me know. However, despite the fanfare, Stitch's Great Escape was met with a mixed reception. While some praised the attraction as a much better, more kid-friendly iteration of the previous show, Many still criticised it. Instead of being scary, now guests were upset at its gross-out nature, complaining in particular of a moment where Stitch burps and a strong chili dog smell fills the room, leaving many people feeling nauseous. Despite the improvement over its predecessor, Stitch's Great Escape gained a reputation among many as being the very worst attraction in the Magic Kingdom, and many regular visitors refused to go near it altogether. Attendance numbers dwindled in the space yet again, and in 2016 it entered seasonal operation, being temporarily used as a stitch meeting route area before finally closing permanently in 2018. The story of extraterrestrial alien encounter is an interesting one because it is just so unlike Disney. Disney are known for playing it safe when it comes to thrills, down the middle content that's not too intense. The parks do have darker themes in some places, but they're usually only dark on the surface. The Haunted Mansion, Tower of Terror, and Dinosaur, to name a few. These are all PG-13 style attractions. But Alien Encounter is the only example that I can think of of a real concerted effort by Disney to terrify people. One thing that I think makes people so fascinated by this attraction is the fact that it simply would never have been made today. In a way, it perfectly encapsulates one of the things about the Eisen era. Eisner's attempts to modernize Disney and to appeal to more than just the standard young family demographic were ambitious, but very hit and miss. While the era created many things we still love today, it was also responsible for some of the strangest stories of wild ideas that just seem so out of place for the parks looking back. Alien Encounter is as much fascinating as it is horrifying, as a story of a time Disney really said, to hell with it and just gave it their all to create something dark and intense. And while I never wrote it myself, from everything I've heard about this attraction, it seems like they really did succeed in that. It was just that they weren't able to make it work with the audience they had. There's potential it could have done better at a park like Hollywood Studios, and I think the entire image of Magic Kingdom just creates this unavoidable expectation of lightheartedness that really damaged Alien Encounter. While I don't think Alien Encounter or Stitch should be brought back in any way, I do find it sad that nothing has been brought in to replace them, and I hope that sometime soon the seemingly cursed space in Tomorrowland gets a more permanent attraction. I hope you've enjoyed my look back at perhaps the scariest attraction Disney has ever made. Let me know what you think about Alien Encounter in the comments. Maybe you went on it, maybe you've just heard about it online. Do you think something like this could still work today, or do you think it's best that Alien Encounter closed when it did? If you have another idea for something you'd like me to cover in the future, please let me know. Other than that, if you're not already subscribed, please consider doing so, and I'll see you next time.